What's up, security token market? We are excited to continue our educational series with Arca, a leading blockchain-focused asset management firm, with our third episode of our six-part video series titled Tokenization for Institutions, What You Need to Know. The goal of this series is to usher in the tokenization playbook to institutions across the map, as tokenization is one of the more under-the-radar verticals within digital assets today. In the last episode, we discussed regulation and adoption with Annalise Osborne, head of institutional at Arca. In this episode, we're joined by none other than ARCA's own veteran Chief Investment Officer, Jeff Dorman. Thanks for coming on, Jeff. I'm also, joined here, today, I'm also joined here today with Peter Gaffney, Head of Research at Secure Token Advisors. So why don't we all introduce ourselves uh, and we'll get into it. I'll kick it off. Uh, I'm Jonah Shulman, Head of Communications at Security Token Market. We are a leading provider of security token data and research. We track over 200 plus tokenized assets totaling over $18 billion in market cap. In fact, the market cap was approximately only $1 billion at the start of the year. So it's been amazing to watch the secondary market exponentially rise. And if you want to learn more and track these assets, head to stm.co. Peter. Awesome. Thanks, Shona. And I'm Peter Gaffney, head of research at Security Token Advisors, the consulting and advisory arm uh, of the company. We actually help advise clients on tokenizing their own assets that's ranging from real estate portfolios and funds and assets to private equity and venture capital interests to pre-IPO shares and more as they come onto our radar, you know, there are unique cases coming up. Uh, we also serve as the midpoint with uh, a lot of industry players in the industry, you know, vendors themselves, anything we can do to create a more robust system and landscape. Uh, one of which today we're actually joined with. Um, I would love to hear from you, Jeff, and what you're working on at ARCA, please. Sure. And, uh, thanks again for having me, guys. Uh, yeah, so Jeff Dorman, Chief Investment Officer and one of the co-founders uh, at Arca. Um, a 20-year veteran of, of markets and fintech, was an investment banker early in my career, was a bond trader, investment grade, down to high-yield distress corporates. Um, worked on the sell side and the buy side, uh, investing across debt and equity prior to getting into fintech and ultimately into digital assets about six years ago. Um, you know, Arca is a full-service investment management firm. Um, you know, dedicated uh, solely to digital assets. Um, you know, we have multiple different fund strategies, uh, everything from liquid token investing using fundamental research um, to uh, yield products, taking advantage of some of the yields offered in the space, to niche products like early stage venture investing, as well as uh, even an NFT fund. Um, but we also have a uh, outside of the asset management arm. We also have a labs division. Um, which is trying to innovate using digital assets and blockchain as the wrapper. Um, and I think we'll get into this, but, but one of the first things we created was the first ever blockchain transferred fund or BTF, um, which intentionally mimics the ETF because it's exactly the same structure in terms of a 1940 act uh, bankruptcy remote product. Um, the only difference is the shares uh, are exclusively traded as tokens that trade peer to peer uh, rather than the traditional exchange traded um, uh, 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 funds that, that are out there today. So doing a lot of innovation on that side um, and, and ultimately just trying to meet different institutional uh, investors and companies' needs with regard to blockchain. That's awesome, Jeff. That's fantastic. And really, uh, it's great to have you on here for episode three. I've been a longtime reader of That's Our Two Satoshis, your newsletter, and I know you guys spun that out into a full blog uh, piece and all that. Um, really respect the views uh, at the intersection of both traditional finance and digital assets. So I think uh, something easy to kind of hop into here for uh, for all our viewers is I would love to hear a bit more about the taxonomy that ARCA created, I think earlier this year. I'm sure it's been in the works for years really, but I think if you want to break that down a bit to get a, you know, give everyone a sense of where digital asset securities kind of fit in that landscape, that would be fantastic. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's funny, I was actually just having a conversation minutes ago with uh, one of the uh, OTC uh, quote unquote brokers in this space um, talking about the exact same thing, right? And a lot of uh, about our taxonomy, because a lot of this stems from what I think is just misinformation that gets thrown around out there, right? E even something simple like the term alts, right? A lot of people describe the digital asset market as Bitcoin or Ethereum and then the alts. And it's such a damaging narrative, one, because it's completely inaccurate, but two, because it just it just acts as if blockchain was only meant to have one or two purposes. And, and therefore, everything else is either not uh, accurate or, or not ever possible to, to be built on. And a lot of people compare digital assets, of course, to commodities um, or to currencies or, or even in some cases, equities. But the reality is this, this market is really much more like the fixed income market, right? Fixed income is a massive, massive market. And 
um, you know, books written about understanding fixed income valuations and, and different types of fixed income securities are, are in the 1500 to 2000 pages long for, for a good reason, right? You have completely different issuer types from govies to munis to corporates. You have completely different uh, uh, ratings from AAA down to, you know, high yield distressed. You have totally different uh, bond structures from callables to puttables to convertibles, preferred, uh, uh, you know, have some have warrants attached. Um, you have different parts of the cap structure from senior secured to unsecured and subordinated. Um, you have different uh, uh, covenants, right, you know, in terms of what a bond issuer can do. And that's really what the digital asset uh, market is becoming, right, is that the blockchain itself is just the wrapper, it, it, almost in the same way that the ETF is a wrapper, right? The first ETF was spiders, of course, S&P 500. But now there's, you know, tens of thousands of ETFs that all you know, can wrap anything, right? You have different sector ETFs, you have equity ETFs, bond ETFs, commodity ETF, currency ETFs. That's really how we see blockchain is that it's not even an asset class at this point. It's just a structure that can house all asset classes. So as a result, you have to start thinking much more beyond what its initial use case was of just Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And you have to start thinking, okay, like where are we now? And also more importantly, where are we headed? So the way we broke it down and, um, you know, we actually wrote a, a, a pretty nice uh, paper in one pager about this that you can check out on our website at AR.ca. But, you know, first you have to think about, okay, who are the issuers um, in digital assets, right? Who, who can actually issue a token? And to start with, you have individuals, right? Any individual can issue a token. We've seen it, right? Uh, NBA player Spencer Dinwiddie issued a token, you know, uh, mm -hmm. loosely tied to the revenues of his NBA contract. Right, right. Um, that token too. Yeah, exactly. Right. You you have um, uh, governments who can issue tokens, right? Whether we get to CBDCs or not, but you know clearly there's going to be government tokens. You have you know companies that are issuing tokens, right? From Binance to FTX to Bitfinex to Axie Infinity. Um, you have organizations that are either issuing or going to issue tokens, right? From Miami Coin to New York City Coin, I believe eventually we'll have universities issuing tokens. You'll have Harvard Coin. You'll have Duke Coin. Um, you know, I think every municip every municipality will issue a token. You'll have you know uh, uh, tokens that are you know funding parks and things like that. And then of course you have DAOs. Um, you know uh, whether they're real DAOs or not. You know sometimes we throw around the term decentralized autonomous organization, and really they're just organizations. But the idea of a DAO at least is a type of an issuer. And then of course you have you know protocols and platforms, right? Your Ethereum's, your you know uh, uh, Algorand, Solana's, and stuff like that. So there's a there's a huge diversity in terms of just who is issuing a token before you even, uh, of course, get into, well, what types of tokens are there now? Well, great, you know, currency is what everyone talks about because Bitcoin is the largest, but a currency itself is just one type of a token, right? You also have asset-backed tokens, tokens that are actually backed by a real hard asset. Um, you know, Nexus Mutual is a good example of that. Nexus Mutual is an insurance company, uh, uh, you know, a DAO uh, doing insurance that has a token that is fully backed by the capital pool uh, of that insurance uh, entity. Um, also, you know, our own Rcoin, which you know we'll talk about, which is the, the first product under our BTF umbrella, the Blockchain Transfer Fund. But Rcoin is just a token that is fully backed by government, uh, U.S. government bonds. Um, you know, so you have that's a completely different use case of a blockchain token than a currency. And then you have um, what we loosely describe as like pass through tokens, um, you know, tokens that basically pass through some value, either in the form of financial value. Um, meaning like, you know, Binance Coin or, or FTX, which actually pass through revenues and profits of their business, um, or like SushiSwap, who actually passes through through a real dividend. Um, but you also have the tokens that pass through some sort of utility or value, right? Some sort of um, actually member or, or a reward for being a part of an ecosystem, right? Getting to use it for discounts, getting to use it for loyalty points. These are just completely different use cases than just cryptocurrency, right? This has nothing to do with store of value or medium of exchange. It just is an entity that has some form of value that can be transferred because of the nature of, of, of blockchain. Um, and then of course, going further, you know, you can go even further to where we're headed, right? Eventually, you know, stocks are gonna be tokenized, right? Bonds are gonna be tokenized. Real estate's gonna be tokenized. Commodities are gonna be tokenized. And all of these will fit into that taxonomy somewhere, right? It's a centralized entity or it's a non-centralized entity. It's a, you know, is it a government? Is it an organization? Is it a company? Is it a pass-through token or an asset-backed token? Uh, and then of course you get into all the different sectors, right? From gaming to NFTs to CeFi and DeFi and Web3. And, and, you know, there's just so much to unpack here that I just think it's one wrong and two, just irresponsible to continue down this path of blockchain is a cryptocurrency and that's the only use case. 
Awesome. No, I, I totally agree. I think the taxonomy that you guys have developed is fantastic. And, you know, it's just it's a technology overlay. Like we always say, blockchain is the new tech overlay. It's not an asset class in its own. It's going to kind of revolutionize and shape the capital markets going forward. I think an important distinction people don't realize is with, let's say, digital asset securities or security tokens specifically, it's just because the underlying blockchain, whether it's Avalanche, Ethereum, Tezos, Algorand, if that's moving around, it doesn't really have a true effect on the price of a secure token per se, right? Because the company, it's the asset that's backing it that really has the value driver there. So that's an important distinction to make. And that's kind of what the taxonomy that you guys developed is doing. I love what you said about the fixed income uh, markets and kind of analogy there. I think I'm gonna have some more on that later. But um, one thing I know Jonah and I are both very curious about, and you write about it a lot, the um, that like every company will have a token, right? I think you've mentioned Netflix before, you've mentioned Amazon and uh, the Amazon Prime memberships and everything. And when we're talking about security tokens, we usually default to like, you know, the real estate piece that's commonly touted or money market funds. I'm looking at something like Arcoin for collateral management, treasury management, all good stuff. I love looking at, you know, pre, uh, pre IPO shares just to give early uh, investors more access into these companies before they go public on the retail level. And that's all great. But I would love to hear what you, you know, what you think about when you're looking at company tokens. Would those be securities? Would they be utilities? Could be a blend, you know, any clarity would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny you ended that with the word clarity, right? Because I think that that's obviously, at least here in the U.S., that's what's completely missing. Yeah. Um, even the word security token, right? I think we all understand the meaning of what we, when we say security token, we mean something that is obviously already viewed in the eyes of the U.S. regulators as a security. And if you bring Scraps that onto blockchain, yeah. right, you know, stocks, exactly. That you're thinking that that's an obvious security. But, you know, you go outside the U.S. and it's already pretty blurry in terms of what would be deemed a security or not. The difference is in the U.S., nobody will even push that envelope because they're so afraid of the SEC. So you won't even see experimentation. But outside of the U.S. and, you know, in Europe and Asia and South America, you do see companies issuing tokens that it's not crystal clear whether they would be viewed as securities or not. Right. I mentioned these pass through tokens or really maybe a better word for it is hybrid tokens. Right. If you have a token that is giving you some sort of financial upside, right? You're getting a piece of the upside revenue or profits of the business. I think it's pretty clear that there is a security component to that. But if that same token is used, you know, to give you access to something on their platform or to give you a discount or something like that, that's not a security, right? I mean, that's just a membership, you know, reward program. That's like a coupon, that's a discount, that's a loyalty program. But when this token represents both at the same time, I don't really know how the regulators are gonna view that. Meaning like, let's take Amazon as an example. Amazon Prime is clearly your member benefits, right? Everybody has an Amazon Prime account. Amazon Shares is clearly the security, the financial upside to the growth of Amazon. It's very easy to distinguish the two and they're really mutually exclusive right now, right? You can be an Amazon Prime member without being a shareholder and you can be a shareholder without being an Amazon Prime member. But in the token world, that exact same dynamic exists, but it's one token and it represents both at the same time, right? I mentioned Binance Coin, for example. The Binance Coin gives you they take 20% of their profits roughly and they buy back tokens. That is no different than Amazon shares, right? They're taking profits and they're distributing it to token holders or shareholders. But at the same time, if you own that BNB token, you get discounts when you trade on Binance, you get access to new tokens that they bring to the Binance platform, you get discounts when with Travala and other companies that they partner with across Asia. That's no different than Amazon Prime, which started with just free shipping, but then they just keep adding benefits to it, like Whole Foods discounts and movies and music. I don't really know if that token is supposed to be a security or not. It has security-like features, but it also has very unsecurity-like features. So I think it's really difficult to even just label something as a security because we, you know, we, we, we've early on in the, in the early days of digital assets, we've decided that some things are securities and some aren't. But where we're headed is companies like Binance and FTX and Bitfinex and Axie Infinity, name it, like they've created the roadmap for whatever other company is going to do. Like I've been using Disney recently as an example, because uh, Raul Paul, Paul and I were talking about, uh, and he brought it up, I thought it was brilliant. It's like, you know, Disney has a, a, what, a couple hundred billion dollar equity market cap, I believe. If Disney issued a token tomorrow, that token would likely have a higher market cap than their equity, because that token would give you discounts to Disney Plus. It would give you fast track, um, a fast pass at the parks. It would give you maybe exclusive, you know, sneak peeks on certain content that they have. It might give you access to Disney's show. I mean, think about all that Disney has as a company and all these things that could be unlocked if Disney were to issue a token. And again, maybe they even say, you know, we'll give 10% of the revenue of Disney on off the top line directly to you as token holders, because we want all of our customers to also be financially aligned with the success of Disney. 
Um, and that's really where I think that tokens are so interesting is that coordination, that stakeholder alignment, where you're no longer just a passive user of a company, you're also financially and incentivized to see that company's success. Um, so when you think about it that way, it's like, this is such a no-brainer. And then, you know, Disney absolutely should be doing this, right? It's non-dilutive capital. They get to issue, they get to book, you know, a, a upfront revenue, um, and they get to empower their customer base to feel their success. But again, I don't know if that token would be a security or not, right? Again, it has security-like features, but it's not exclusively a security when you have all this utility value that comes with the use case of that token. And you start thinking beyond that and you're like, this is just the greatest capital formation and customer bootstrapping mechanism we've ever seen because how many things in your daily life do you use as a user or a customer that you have absolutely no upside in no upside at all and no care is really of the success of the business i mean take netflix for example right we all have a netflix subscription i could care less if netflix went away tomorrow what do i care i don't know netflix shareholders i don't care if it goes away i'll go to, you know i'll go do amazon prime and um you know uh, hulu and, and you know everywhere else like disney plus to get content there's absolutely no brand loyalty or customer loyalty if you're not financially incentivized to see it succeed. And it goes way beyond, you know, Fortune 500 companies. Think about, you know, your local bodega who, you know, you get a deli sandwich from once a week or the place you get your hair cut or the, you know, I have two young kids. I, I can tell you every Saturday and Sunday, I do a bunch of random things with my kids that I have no financial incentive or upside to. I get nothing out of it. Um, and then on the flip side, I've been a Starbucks shareholder for 20 years. I've literally never had, a, never had a cup of coffee in my life. The only time I ever use Starbucks is to steal their Wi-Fi or to use their bathroom. So I get no financial, I get no utility value at all from Starbucks, but I get financial upside. Starbucks gets absolutely nothing from me because I'm not a customer. Like there is such massive misalignment there between customer and, and state and stakeholder that it just makes no sense. So I think that's where we're headed. And I think as much as the success you mentioned earlier about the growth of the STO market, the security token market and where we're headed, the reality is the security token market, in my opinion, is being held back by the fact that there just hasn't been a mind blowing product yet that everybody has to own. Like if Disney issued a token tomorrow and said, it is a security, yeah. we, went, we went through the SEC registration process, it is a security and we're issuing it. Guess what? The security token market would you know 10X overnight because everybody would buy that token. But when you have, you know, a, an LP interest in some small obscure hedge fund just tokenizing the shares of their fund, nobody really cares about that, right? If you tokenize some $40 million hotel in Denver and, you know, cool, it's nice, it's, 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 a, it's a great experiment, but nobody cares about that. You need to tokenize something we need that some people catalyst. care about. You need something that people feel like they have to own, right? Like if you yeah. tokenize the Mona Lisa, right? Or you tokenize the Titanic, or you tokenize, you know, uh, uh, Amazon shares. That's something that people feel like they have to own and they will figure out how to own it. And that's the big disconnect in my opinion is there's a lot of cute experimentation going on. There's a lot of, of you know groundwork being laid right now that will eventually be the reason that the security token market is huge. But you just haven't had that no brainer product yet that people are like, I gotta figure out how to own an SDO because right. I'm not missing out on this. Right, I think you're, you made some good points there. And I think the overarching theme is this technology is pervasive and it's extremely, flexible and creative and in super in-depth and super breadth in terms of like the use cases that you can leverage using blockchain is it opens up the floodgates of opportunities whether it's connecting with customers more or creating liquidity for for funds or real estate um and i think there's some really cool projects there but i also think there's some massive catalysts that are going to come and i think a part of it is what you're saying is that there is no clarity really in the us i mean you have um, you know, the BTF model like Arcoin that has been the exact model of an ETF, but you add a technology overlay on top of it. I think that's huge, but I think we need exact clarity of for these institutions of what you can and can't do to enter that gray area, as well as there's some pretty cool catalysts that are coming out. For example, um, Opulus. Have you heard of Opulus is doing these these uh, security tokens via RegCF, a, a pretty big artist by the name of Kyle and Taiga and Little Pump have, have been able to bring in thousands of investors to tokenize securities. So I think if you, like you're saying with Netflix and, and Peloton in your article, do mainstream issuances, you'll bring in those, those people. Um, I also think that there is a really potential huge catalyst coming that Gemini has been approved. Uh, I believe they're BDATS is Gemini Galactic Markets approved to trade digital asset securities. As we know, Gemini is a private company. I think that would be so cool 
to see the Winklevi literally issue a tokenized equity of their of Gemini and then start yeah. trading on their ATS to bring in thousands, if not millions, of people instantly overnight. Yeah, and I, you know I, that's actually I, I, uh, April of last year when Coinbase IPO'd. I actually was very adamantly upset about why they didn't do a tokenized yeah, stock well. offer because th- th- this was one of the hottest IPOs. Granted, it's done horrifically since coming, right? I mean. Was down 80 percent but at the time it was one of the hottest ipos they had an obligation as a leader of this industry in my opinion to um do that and to break you know break the bar or you know expand the boundaries in terms of what that is be like look if you want to own the tokenized stock of one of the hottest companies at the time in blockchain you're gonna have to figure out how to do it you're gonna have to figure out how to own yep. a token you're gonna have to figure out how to, you know, get a wallet or custody. You're gonna have to figure out how to trade on, on one of these ATSs. Like that is the kind of company and leadership that you need in the blockchain space to say, like, again, we are going to be a leader. This is what we're gonna do. And you're, if you want to own it, this is how you have to learn how to own it. And I think you do need some of those pioneers. I hope Gemini does it, and I hope Gemini is a big enough awesome. name and brand and company. To, to, you know, I'm not 100 sure Gemini matters enough to pull that off as much as Coinbase did. Um, sure. But I hope, but I hope they try. You um, know what's interesting about that is. I don't know. I, I, I was doing some research on this. I'm not sure if this ever fully came to fruition, but there was a point in time where they acquired um, a BD ATS or they have that license still under their belt. And I have this theory um, that, you know, there's SEC regulation is coming. There was that class action lawsuit of, I think, like 74, 79 cryptos on Coinbase that were seen as unregistered securities. There could be a point in time where Coinbase is thinking ahead. They're clearly aware of, you know, regulation and, and tokenization and security tokens where if any of those cryptos traded on Coinbase are deemed illegal or unregistered securities, they could hypothetical, hypothetically just put it on their, on the ATS and have it trade there. If you still own that crypto or you still want to trade it, you would just move on to that specific platform. Yeah, I mean, look, the, 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 the reality is like the world we need to head to, which I think is going to be so cool and so powerful is when all of your assets are represented in a token form, right? Like mm-hmm. think about, Think about, you know, first of all, I, I can't think of an industry that everybody hates more than banking in the sense that nobody is happy with their bank. It's annoying. You got to jump through all these hoops to get access to your own money. Um, you know, most of us, at least in the digital asset industry, have at some point had our bank, you know, frozen or, or suspended because of some transaction that they deemed, you know, crazy. Um, it, it is a horrific experience, not to mention with inflation, there's zero reason to ever own cash in the first place, right? The only reason anybody owns cash is for liquidity. So all of a sudden you think about it, like, well, wait a minute, we now have the technology to turn every single ownable asset into a spendable asset, right? We're bridging the gap between investment and payment vehicle into one thing. When you think about that, it's like, well, why in the world would anybody ever own cash again if you can spend your investments, right? You know, think about the inequality in the world is because people can't actually invest because they have no ability to, because they need to, you know, make payments, they need to have that cash on hand. Well, if you could just invest 100% of your money at all times, but still use that money anytime you need it, you get to a world where it's like, okay, well, we don't ever have to own cash. I can own, you know, 20% of my net worth in a house and 20% in Bitcoin or Ethereum and 20% in stocks and 20% in, you know, whatever else. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, I got to make a you know payment. Well, here you go. Just pro rata, take it out of all of my investments, right? Because I can just spend anything uh, at any time, right? And then you start think about well think about where the nft market is going to go right you're going to have an nft representation of your jewelry of your car of you know your deed to your yep. house and all of a sudden this becomes an asset that you can in theory have a liquid market for and be able to spend so you know that's the perfect world and it's actually you know embarrassing and frustrating that everybody is so afraid of the regulators and what the sec is going to do simply because they haven't provided any clarity that a lot of these things that in my opinion seem absolutely inevitable are simply being delayed because totally. of the fact that we can't figure out where this stuff fits. And it's really frustrating because, you know, again, I, I can give you thousands of real world examples of like how that would work. In fact, I've told this story many times. I think it's the most powerful is like, I have a, a, a neighbor who was a big real estate investor and our kids were playing outside and he got a call from someone on like a Saturday saying like, hey, there's this property in Hawaii, it's gonna go fast. You know, you do wanna get in on it. And after he got on the phone, he was like, well, this sucks. And I was like, why? He's like. Well, I don't have any liquid cash right now, and <laughs> this property is going to go fast. And he's like, I have to wait till Monday morning yeah, to sell terrible. some stock. I have to wait T plus one for that stock to settle at my brokerage account. I have to wait T plus one to set to send that from the brokerage account. To yeah, imagine account. if Monday was a holiday as well. Right? Yeah, exactly. All right, and then you got to wire the money, which is going to take you know anywhere from you know one to three days. Right? He's like, he's like it's Thursday or Friday at the earliest that I could even get money there for this property. 
Whereas like, if you really get to where we're headed, it's like, oh, okay, I can make you a payment in T plus 10 minutes because I'll send any, you know, I can send my tokenized Tesla equity or I can send, you know, my digital asset or I can send my, uh, uh, you know, a, a piece of the equity in my house, whatever, right? And it's just like, it's such, it just makes so much more sense that it's really frustrating that it's so much of this is being held back, not by innovation, but by the fear of what happens to you if you innovate. Yeah, right. And I think that that was one of the coolest pieces about the BTF model, um, like that our coins built on, is that you don't have to settle funds in cash or in something and then buy a new fund, you could just swap them out, right? I mean, that's kind of what you're saying in the future. If you have everything tokenized, you don't necessarily need to settle in cash if you're comfortable swapping products specifically. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was, I mean, look, we, we went through uh, the process with the SEC for, for almost two and a half years in terms of getting exemptive relief for this product, right? And for those not familiar, the SEC doesn't really say like, yes, we approve a product. It basically just stops saying, no, we don't approve it. And eventually right, right, it's right. like, okay, it's, you're free to go. It took us like two and a half years to get through that process to get exemptive release. And when we issued the first blockchain transferred fund, we tried to do the most basic boring product in the world, which is, you know, short duration U.S. Treasury, because every, you know, it's the most liquid, most safe instrument in the world. It's the most, you know, adopted instrument in the world. Um, you know, you could argue that treasuries and Bitcoin are probably the only truly like global, ubiquitous, liquid market, right, where everybody in the world has some sort of, you know, interest or exposure to it. Um, you know, so treasuries was like, okay, let's put these treasuries into a trust, right? That's how an ETF or a BTF works, right? Is you basically put the assets in a trust and then you have shares that represent your interest in that trust. Right. Um, those shares can trade on an exchange like an ETF or they can trade as a token like our BTS. But, you know, when you trade the uh, R coin uh, token, you are effectively just transferring the interest in this trust that is fully, you know, backed by these treasury assets. So you think about something like the treasury market, like most of the world runs on the treasury market, right? From, you know, a, a settlement to, um, you know, a, a trading, et cetera. This still is a T plus one uh, market, right? You know, so much of finance is based on the fact that you do a trade and you got to wait at least T plus one or T plus two or T plus three to settle it. Now you can do it instantaneously or, or you know, T plus 10 minutes, depending on which blockchain you're using and how fast it takes to, to send it. But that's a huge, huge win for uh, uh, you know finance companies as well as just regular treasury management for any company to be able to have an instrument like that. So you know, as we know, uh, you know it's still early, and you know ultimately there'll be other products within our BTF library besides just government bonds. We'll have you know anything that can be you know anything that you can put into a trust. Effectively, we will eventually have a BTF for one day, um, but it, it's. You know, you have to get these companies and projects and, 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 and you know, in, in finance and insurance and in regular corporate America and, and beyond to understand how important it is to have something like this that is, you know, a tier one capital that's viewed as, you know, the most highly rated capital in the world to be able to instantly settle. Um, so, we'll, you know, we'll get there as an industry, we'll get there as a company, we'll get there as a product and stuff. But again, a lot of this is being held back by not necessarily our product, but by these ATSs and other products that are on there, right? You have to get people who care about being on an ATS you know, to trade this, or you have to loosen the rules to let, to let, you know, things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and BNB trade on the exact same place as something like, you know, the security interest in a, the tokenized security interest in a hotel or the tokenized, you know, uh, uh, interest in an, uh, as an LP in a fund or, you know, a BTF like our coin. As a kind of as a final thought on this specific subject on my end, um, we get a lot of prospective clients and clients looking to issue like investment DAOs or NFTs with revenue share, profit share through royalties, all that. The default is that hey, this is partially a security. You know, we have to at least abide by that. And it's always like you know, you're kind of saying Jeff, there's kind of a, an inhibiting factor that slows the growth. Now, all I'm thinking about after this conversation is the company token model and what we could really do. Either, the future is hybrid. That's obvious. Um, so there's always going to be a one two punch with like security token and utility token. But I'm thinking about now, how do we combine that into one? And it kind of seems like the, the company token model that we were just talking about is the solution right there. So that'll be extremely interesting to see how that comes to fruition in conjunction with everything else happening. Um, so that has my wheels turning. I'm sure after this call, I'll be doing some diligence on that and figuring out how to implement that a bit more. So excited for more on that. But so far, so good. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm excited about it too. Like I, I, I laugh all the time because I, you know, as a as a former bond investor, you know, I've, I've traded a lot of airline bonds, right? And airlines, the airline industry is one of the you know dumbest industries in the world, right? They all go bankrupt every seven years. Somehow, somehow they continue <laughs> to get capitalized, right? There's there's no reason for That's these funny. to be 
there's no reason for these to be public companies, right? They should be nationalized because they're doing a service for you know the world. And, but yet somehow they're still private companies and public companies and, and, and have equity and then they go bankrupt and start over. Um, it, it, it is, they, there's no, no industry in the world that has more of their assets encumbered, right? They have you know debt on every single plane. Um, they're now, uh, I remember it was United or Delta a few years ago, we're like, hey, now we should issue debt back by our loyalty points. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the dumbest <laughs> thing ever. You already go, you already have so much debt on your balance sheet and you already have all of your assets encumbered. And here you have an opportunity to issue a token that is basically your, your, you know, your Delta Sky Miles or your United points, but have it also, you know, have all these other unique features and this creativity that you can use. And in, instead of having debt and more encumbered assets, you can actually make this non-dilutive capital and do it the right way and empower your customers. I mean, think about like, if you live in Atlanta, right? And all you ever do is fly Delta. And then all of a sudden you move to Houston and now you're going to have to fly United all the time. It's like, that's terrible, right? Your Delta miles are just dead. You're never going to use them again and they're dead and you right. have to start up. It's like, well, how about being able to exchange those, you know, very easily because this is a tokenized asset and you can sell them for Bitcoin or you can trade them for, you know, United miles. And it's like, we're locked into these mini ecosystems, even though we now have the technology and the ability to no longer be locked in. And it's in everyone's best interest to do it, but nobody wants to be first. And nobody wants to be first largely because they have no idea what to do with it. Even if you look at the pioneers who have done it, I think it was Stacks was the first one. And then um, was it INX was the other one who issued, you know, tokenized Drop stock. And yeah, and it's like, if you actually yep. read, if you actually read the perspectives of those offerings, they're, they're completely guessing, right? They're like, you know, it, 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 first of all, they, they issued, you know, an S1 and a prospectus, which means it's a security offering. But if you actually read the document, it's not a, they're not, they're saying, we're basically just booking this as upfront revenue because it's a token that is essentially like selling forward a future service in our business. It's like, well, right off the bat, like, well, that makes no sense. Why are we doing a securities filing in a shelf to issue a security, but booking it as revenue? That doesn't make any sense, right? So, but they're not getting any leadership or guidance from the regulators. They're just guessing in terms of like, how is this gonna, how is this gonna fit from an accounting standpoint? How is this gonna fit from a regulation standpoint? And it's great to see it. Like I applaud Stacks and I applaud INX for trying it, but it's like, if, if we're all just guessing anyway, then somebody who's well capitalized needs to be like, all right, I'm just going to do it, and we'll, you know, we'll be, we'll, we'll, we'll eat it, and we'll take the legal pain that comes with the three-year process, and, and like everything in the in the court system, it's usually there's no clear-cut answer until you have precedent, right? Somebody has to win or lose a court case until and, and make precedent, and then that precedent gets followed forever. Um, I think somebody just has to do that. Somebody big and powerful and important that actually people care about is going to have to go through this and do it. And then once it happens once, every company in the world is going to do it. Like when I mentioned Disney token or Netflix token or Starbucks token or Delta token, there's not a single investor in the world. And I've spoken to a lot of them from pensions to endowments, et cetera, who aren't like, yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. You're absolutely right. That is the future. You know, bridging investments with payment vehicles is the future. But I don't know who's going to do it first. I have no idea how they're going to do it, right? And it's like, it, it, you know, it's like, uh, you know, we got step one, we got step three, but nobody has figured out step two. Well, I wrote about uh, tokenized loyalty rewards with a, uh, a mileage focus a few months ago. So I'm glad there's some validation there. That's great. <laughs> maybe, maybe they'll be the first. Maybe they'll be the first movers. We'll see. I would love to swap for my American Airlines miles if I had another. I mean, why not? Why do I have to be in that closed system? Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think you make some good points. That, and I, I think there's there's some still really bad negative connotation around the technology blockchain. You know, still from the ICO era, we were recovering from that and all the scam. And then we still have rug pulls today and then the Luna fiasco. What I think people need to understand is that just because it's running on blockchain does not mean it has anything to do with the securities world. It's just the same technology that it's underpinning. Uh, similarly, an analogy could be like with the Internet. Um, you know, Ethereum could be uh, a common website, maybe ESPN.com. They both, it runs on the internet and it could be another analogy of another website that's completely different use case. I don't know, like Facebook, you know, uh, one's for watching statistics and sports, one's for communicating with your friends and family They both run on the internet. If the ESPN internet goes down, does that mean the Facebook goes down? Not necessarily. They're just completely different use cases. Um, you know, I think what it comes down to is people need to realize that and i i think as we know as you mentioned we need a catalyst so if we were talking on a low-hanging fruit you know for an institution who wanted to get in the tokenization realm what is like the easiest thing that they can do without the fear without the resistance without the friction that they could start implementing appending to their infrastructure maybe is it treasury 
uh, management? Is it collateral management? What can you know an institution do? Start adding and start to move into the the tokenization realm that feel comfortable about this future. Yeah, it's a good question. And before I even answer that, I'll, I'll go deeper in what you said, right? I mean, I think I think the misinformation out there is incredibly mm-hmm. damaging, right? Like, I, 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 it's almost like you know, if every single equity investor in the world had to listen to, to people talk about GameStop and AMC for three months before they were ever allowed to buy another stock, by the end of that, exactly. they'd be like, well, I'm never going to buy a stock. This is ridiculous. Why would I ever buy a stock if AMC and GameStop are representative of what the stock market is? And of course, nobody thinks that because we can compartmentalize. We can be like, no, AMC, GameStop are kind of these weird meme coins, and it's not really indicative of the rest of the market. You know, we can we can talk about them, but let's sort of, you know, let's not get crazy assuming that the rest of the market is like those two stocks. Yet that's exactly what happens in digital assets, right? The first thing they ever hear about is Bitcoin or Dogecoin, and they yep. start assuming that everything in the market is therefore Bitcoin or Dogecoin, and it basically shuts them off for the rest of the market, even though, as you just said, there are entirely different use cases and tokens that have nothing to do with each other. So part of it is just the media is just crushing this industry with the, the how much they focus on the two tokens that have the least representative uh, of what the rest of the industry is. Um, but part of it also is, you know, the internet was allowed to quietly build um, without the internet. You know, meaning like Very true. Very most true. of the most of the things that broke and didn't work and caused losses and all that stuff weren't like immediately known to everyone in the world through social media. Whereas, like you know, with this experimentation of blockchain is also being you know watched and narrated in real time. Um, so it's a little harder for things to just go under the radar and for experimentation to happen. And you get things, you know, like, I, you know, I truly believe that Luna was not a Ponzi. It was very transparent with what it was. Now it was experimental, but it was not a Ponzi, right? Like people knew exactly what they were trying to do. But in like, you know, if you had a, a, a internet analogy in the 1990s or early 2000s of Luna, it never would have gotten as big as it did before it collapsed. You know, part of the reason it got as big as it did is just because there is so much coverage in media and social media and the ability to make something bigger than, it, than it's ready for, right? So, you know, things like Luna will fail all the time. They're just generally not supposed to get to 60 billion of assets before they do. Um, <laughs> You know, so when you think about it that way, it's like so some of that is just sort of a narrative that you just have no choice to have to fight. Like this is the world we live in with constant 24-7 news and social media, and you just have to live in that misinformation world. Um, but that being said, you know, most people that we talk to who are new, you know, five years ago, they had no choice but to listen to Bitcoin and go through Bitcoin to get in, right? Bitcoin was every single person's honor. Now, obviously, there's more on rent, right? There's stable coins, there's DeFi, there's gaming, there's, you know, uh, things like the, the R coin BTF. There's ways to get involved in blockchain now without having to go through the traditional way we did, which was Bitcoin. Um, so in terms of how do you do that, right? You, you have to solve a problem first, right? You can't just say, here's a product, go use it. You have to listen right. and be like, what are you actually solving for, right? So, so for example, you know, insurance companies have asset liability mismatches. They have tier one security, or tier one capital ratios that they have to deal with. They have to deal with, you know, liquidity and settlement. Like that's a great industry to start teaching about something like an R coin or a BTF, which is basically the exact same investment you already are making anyway, but here's a way to settle it faster and to, um, you know, use it as the same exact uh, liquidity capital ratios that you already do, but have much more utility and functionality from it, right? It's going to take years for the insurance industry to, understand, to figure out how to actually implement it. But that's a natural use case, right? Bank settlement, same thing, right? Banks have to settle assets constantly. Like, you know, regardless of what the public statements by CEOs about Bitcoin, they're all trying to figure out how to actually use blockchain in some way because they get it. They see the writing on the wall that T plus two, T plus three make no sense in this day and age. Um, so I think you start to have to solve some of these problems, right? Is it a corporate treasury that has, you know, billions of dollars of, of cash and assets on their balance sheet that they really can't utilize very quickly? Maybe you go to them and be like, hey, what if you want to make an acquisition on a Saturday, but there's a bidding war and there's three companies bidding for the same company and you can, you know, get the money to them on Saturday afternoon versus someone else who has to wait till Monday. Maybe that's a selling point, right? Or, or maybe hey, maybe you need to earn a little bit more of a return on your treasury, but you're worried about liquidity. Well, here's a way to earn a return and have liquidity at the same time. So you start to solve these problems one by one, and I think you can actually start to see some of these companies and projects do it. But but there's this real stigma and fear about being first, and that's always the case with new technology. And you know, eventually there will be some company who just says, you know, I'm willing to be first, I'm willing to do it. And you've seen it, right? You've seen it in certain ways from a micro strategy to a Tesla to, you know, guys who are putting Bitcoin in the balance sheet, but you know, those aren't really the right companies to necessarily be the leaders. And that might probably not be the right asset to be the the, the one you experiment with just because it's so volatile. But there, there will be plenty of case studies in five or 10 years of 
you know, organizations and companies who kind of figure out, I need to solve a problem, blockchain solves a problem, and I'm going to do right. it quietly, and then eventually I'll tell my story and everyone else will do it too. Right. I think um, and when it comes down to it, um, it's not really, I mean, yeah, blockchain has amazing use cases, but the but the, the outcome of using blockchain in, in some of those initiatives like liquidity management or, or bank um, collateral management, et cetera, is there's so much cost savings there and in efficiency, you know, after hours, weekends, as you mentioned, that people will follow that similar analogy as well as with El Salvador using, you know, adding Bitcoin as legal tender. There's apparently it seems like there's a ton of benefits there. And now it maybe other countries will follow suit because they were the first, you know, they went through and uh, took that risk and, and ignored the fear. So I think, you know, banks and other institutions are starting to do that now. And other banks and institutions will see all of the cost savings and the benefits of using blockchain. And then you know, maybe there'll be a, hopefully a snowball effect. And you're seeing it too. And I'm not maybe the best person to speak about this because I don't focus on it too much, but you're seeing it in some of the biggest asset managers out there, the guys who have huge securitization businesses, um, you know, from CLOs to, uh, 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 you know, CDOs and stuff like that, where they are, you know, it's a three week process to settle a bank loan, right? Three weeks. And there's a lot of middlemen and costs that go into that. That is absolutely something that these big asset managers, and I'm talking about the big guys, right? Your, your, your Apollos, your Aries, your Blackstones, like the guys who are managing hundreds of billions of dollars who have huge securitization books, they are, trust me, they are looking at blockchain, right? And they are looking at ways to figure out how do we improve this three week, timely and costly process of settling, um, you know, a, a bank debt and bank loans. So, you know, there are people doing it. It's just like that isn't the splashy story necessarily that, you know, goes viral and, you know, makes it everywhere around the world. So, but but it's absolutely happening. Um, you know, I remember when, when JP Morgan coin was first announced, I, I remember um, my first react, and this is maybe two years ago, right, when they first started talking about it. My first reaction when I was reading about what they were talking about was how the hell is this not doesn't already exist like every other time i'm like oh this is amazing we're gonna be able to transfer assets between our banks instantaneously and, and i'm like are you telling me that 25 years after the internet allowed me to you know have a uh, send a 300 page document in five minutes around the world or have a video call with 400 people around the world where instantaneously you can communicate any way you want for free and boundaryless that JP Morgan in turn in its own banks can't even figure out how to <laughs> send something <laughs> terrible. Free, you know, free and yeah. timely. I was like, I, I was as much as I was excited that someone like JP Morgan was experimenting with their own coin to settle their own uh, uh, transaction. I just like I was floored that we just accept the fact that that doesn't already exist. Like, how can a company within its own uh, uh, walls not be able to do this already in this day and age? So, you know, in that way, it's inevitable, but it's also like just amazing to me that this hasn't already been just adopted everywhere. Definitely. I mean, and even at the time JPM coin was announced, maybe 2019 or 2020 around then, I think everyone, myself included, honestly thought it was a product like a, a new digital asset or a new crypto trying to become the new, you know, decentralized payments, whatever. Um, but it's not obviously it kind of acts as a settlement coin, like you said, Jeff, and even their, their Onyx, their repo, blockchain based repo initiative been doing pretty well, 300 billion in volume uh, in just about 18 months or so. That's very impressive. I think that's a great institutional case right there. I have some major banks hopping in. Would love to see more hop in on that and kind of build, um, you know, the reputation there. I think it also plays into our coins role as collateral management. I think it's all kind of pushing the tide forward in conjunction, which is, you know, fantastic. I'm not sure you've been keeping up with that front, but I think, you know, it's kind of been catching my eye lately from their end. Well, well yeah, I mean, look, the, the reality is like, you've seen the parallel to this before, right? There was the intranet and there was the internet, right? The intranet right, right. was these private closed systems that, you know, I'm an old guy. I was in college in the you know late '90s, early 2000s. Like, you know, we had our intranet, right? And it was like that's all you use. And it was like really weird to go beyond the <laughs> internet into the internet and see what other schools were doing and other people were doing. So that uh, J.P. Morgan coin is effectively right, the right. internet, yeah. right? Something, mm -hmm. some, something like our coin could eventually be the internet, right? Where it's like you can use J.P. Morgan coin all you want inside of J.P. Morgan, but guess what? Bank of America is probably not using it, and Wells Fargo is probably not using it, right? Like, you know, these guys are not going to be, you know, just adopting the other bank's internal system. So yeah. at some point, you still are going to need something outside of that system. So maybe J.P. Morgan coin runs everything through J.P. Morgan, and maybe Wells Fargo coin runs everything through Wells Fargo. But essentially, when they have to settle outside of that, they use something like our coin, right? So you know, there there is. Um, 
everything in the space, regardless of whether it works or not, is awesome, right? It's awesome to see the experimentation. It's awesome to see, um, you know, all of these different uh, uh, leaders kind of trying to figure out how to use blockchain in some way, shape or form, um, you know, but ultimately, you know, you, you do need some bigger um, tokens, some bigger projects to basically be interoperable and be kind of that, you know, transcendent thing that everybody's just using. Um, and that's likely not to be, you know, driven by a, a, a private company, right? It's going to be something, you know, much more bigger and, and, and less, um, you know, corporate focused. Awesome. And like you said, our coin could be the borderless version of all these things. So yeah, excited we have for more. You know, I have a, I have one kind of open ended question. You know, we mentioned earlier fixed income is going to come back here. Um, given your background, given your time, your, you know, earlier in your career and everything I'm reading right now, The Bond King by, by, um, Mary, Mary Childs about Bill Gross at PIMCO, which are the 2000s, 05, 06, 07, 08, 09. Very interesting. You know, I'm kind of getting more clarity on that. I would love to hear your opinion on this. Would tokenization of all these bonds, you know, these debt products, would that ease recessionary activity or downturns given the liquidity, given the lack or, you know, lack of liquidity premiums if people had the fire sale or would it kind of be a negative feedback loop that makes it easier for people to dump and kind of push prices down more i would love to hear clarity on that um it's something i've been going back and forth on reading this and kind of bringing it to the tokenization space and figuring out how things would be if um you know tokenization was around back in 08 let's call it yeah i mean there's 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 you know i, I think one misconception about tokenization is that just because you tokenize something immediately, it's going to be more liquid, right? It, no, you need the market, the, of course, yeah. Right. right. I mean, there's no question that it allows it to be more liquid, but you still do need the market makers. You still do need the interest on both sides, right? It's the equivalent of like, you know, I could create eBay tomorrow, right? But nobody, it's not going to work if I don't you have buy all the sell different, on right? You still need to have all the buyers and all the sellers to make it work. So, um, you know, tokenizing by itself doesn't just create liquidity. However, Ultimately, when you do have everybody operating on the same rails, it does increase liquidity. So, you know, take the bond market, for example, right? You know, whether it's it's corporate bonds or government bonds, you know, it is definitely less liquid, of course, than, you know, your equities and your commodities and your currencies. Sometimes that's a good thing, right? You know, sometimes it's not a bad thing that, you know, you have to shop a big block and have to kind of wait for a big buyer to show up. Sometimes it's terrible, right? You want to see that liquidity. You want to be able to get bigger in something, you know, because you know that you can get out of it if you have to. Um, you know, I think th there's been t plenty of technological advancements outside of blockchain trying to address the liquidity in the bond market. For example, you know, it's still kind of ridiculous that if PIMCO wants to sell a bond and BlackRock wants to buy one, they're basically at the mercy of, you know, 60 different fragmented broker dealers to see like, you know, PIMCO might be trying to sell it to JP Morgan and, Gold you know, and, and, and Goldman might be trying to sell it to BlackRock. And for some reason, Goldman and um, you know, JP Morgan just don't match up and you have this completely inefficient, illiquid thing where, you know, <laughs> Goldman is bidding higher than JP Morgan's offering and it just doesn't match up for a few days or whatever. And of course that makes no sense. So there's been projects and companies that have been trying to figure that out. Like, why can't BlackRock just go directly to PIMCO? And why can't they just match in a dark pool where you don't know who's selling and who's buying, but for bigger guys, they can just match directly. And it's had limited success. It's, you know, there is these, there are some of these transactions that happen. Um, you also have companies that have been focusing on like the retail market, right? I don't know if you've ever tried to buy a bond through a Schwab or a Fidelity account, but like I used to be a bond trader at Merrill Lynch Institutional, right? Um, I remember when my grandmother died, I inherited some of her bonds and I went to Fidelity to sell a bond and they were like, okay, your price is like, you know, 94 cents in the dollar. And I'm like, I am the trader at Merrill Lynch trading this. And I'm telling you, it's trading at 99. They're like, well, our bid's 94. And I'm like, I, like, uh, actually, sorry, it wasn't even Philly. It was actually at Merrill. I was using Merrill's retail brokerage account while I was trading at Merrill. And Merrill basically had to go through me to trade the bond. And I'm telling them I'm bidding 99 for the bond. They're like, yeah, we'll pay 94. And of course, that's ridiculous, right? Because it's like there's just so many middlemen and so many fees. But, you know, the retail market is really big into bonds. People, you know, most retail investors understand a bond more, more than they understand stock and they want to get that coupon and they want to buy it. But the the, the, the industry, the, the, the dealers are so fragmented and the prices are so bad. And, you know, it's hard to buy $30,000 of a bond when it typically only trades, you know, millions or five or 10 millions at a time. So. You know, because nobody wants to warehouse that 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 um, you know with the balance sheet. Nobody wants to warehouse just a thirty thousand thirty thousand dollar liquid bond position. So, um, you know, I think all these. I think the idea of tokenizing bonds absolutely helps. There's no question. It absolutely helps. Um, but at the same time, 
it, you know, it, it's not just the tokenization. It's that you just need one place where everybody's doing everything, and it just increases liquidity. Like you know, anytime there's there's friction in workflow, it slows things down, right? If I have to log into Fidelity to trade some stocks, and then I have to log into Coinbase to trade some, you know, Bitcoin, and I have to log into whatever yeah. T0 or whoever to, you know, trade some security tokens, and then I got to go to my bank. It's like, that just sucks, right? It's just a terrible experience when you got to go to 15 different places to do everything. So I really truly believe we'll have a world one day where you just have all your assets on your phone as blockchain based assets of some sort is and you can go to one place and do everything and that one stop shop you know it might be a different one stop shop for everyone right now it may not be it's not like there's going to be a monopoly per se but that's when liquidity improves when you can just do everything in one place and it's just easy so you know it's a long grind though because there's a lot of companies out there who are incentivized to make that not happen because they make all that money on these inefficiencies and the fees so you know, I, I think it's inevitable. I think we'll get there, but I'm not 100% sure that just tokenizing bonds or fixed income itself is the answer to liquidity. I think it's really more, can we get these one-stop shops? Can we make it just easier for everyone to transact? I know that uh, that is music to Jonah's ears. He's the king of frictionless processes, talks about it probably five times a day. Yeah, so very you, know, you guys are on the same page with that. 100%. Yeah, I think less walled gardens, less fragmented, fragmented floats. Make every, I think that's the sentiment today. Everything is available at the touch of a button, whether you want to order food, whether you want to go from point A to point B, whether you want to watch something that's a, on demand and the financial markets are so behind. Um, but it, we're moving there and it, it's going to be an exciting evolution. As you said, it's definitely inevitable. We're moving in that direction. It's just only a matter of time. Yeah, well, and, 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 it, and importantly, like before, before the financial industry was behind because the technology wouldn't allow it to be we move forward right now we finally have the technology to do it so now it's more of just you know who's incentivized to make it happen how do we make it happen which is a much better place to be in than you know we, there's a problem but there's no solution now there's a problem and a solution we just have to figure out how to actually make it happen just get them onto the blockchain rails once everyone once you know institutions are on the same or compatible blockchain rails then it could really open up and the floodgates could really open up to your point of frictionless everything and everything in one place even if it's a handful of different players, if they could at least play together, that's beautiful. And that's where we all come in. Security token market providing the data and information people to learn about it. Security token advisors helping people guide through the space and get on the rails and arc up creating investment products and, and leading the way in that realm and educating the institutions. Um, Good pitch. But <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for coming on. This is awesome. I think. It probably about wraps it up. I feel like we literally could talk for years. There's so much to talk about. It's so exciting. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on. This was super cool and awesome. This is going to be uh, on the Security Token Market YouTube and I think your guys' YouTube as well. So uh, be sure to follow uh, us on all our relevant social medias and go to ar.ca to learn more about ARCA and as well as stm.co to learn more about uh, Security Token Market. So uh, yeah, thanks for coming on and see you all next month with another ARCA killer employee. <laughs>